Good morning, Lincroft. Please stand and worship with us in song. We're going to sing only a holy God.
Good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here, here at LBC. We are transformed by the gospel to be rooted in Christ, connected in community, and engaged in mission. We're very glad that you're with us uh, this morning. And so the gospel uh, changes us, and it changes our identities. And one of those identities we have as a church is to be family. And uh, one of the things that we uh, work hard to do here is try to break down the generational divides that can be so uh, prevalent uh, in our culture today. And a couple of weeks ago, we had the Connect 55 ministry, which is for adults 55 and older, uh, go bowling with our college students. And uh, the, uh, the event I heard was, uh, I, everyone who participated in it, I've heard really awesome things. And it's just a way that we can begin intermingling uh, with one another and getting to know one another because we are family. And investing uh, in people across the various life stages from nursery through adulthood is very important uh, for us. And we love college students and we make a heavy investment uh, in college students. And so um, a couple of weeks ago, they also attended a uh, conference called Jubilee. And so we're just going to give a short recap video of that experience for them. And then Megan Salas, who's on staff here at the Church for Campus Ministry, will also uh, give a short testimonial about that experience. Get back to the business. I feel the spirit moving through the city. I got the light shining, come get it. Walking with Christ, moving where it's gritty. Walking with Christ, moving where it's gritty. I feel the spirit moving through the city. I see the people trying to bring them with me. We got a light, tell them come and get it. Yeah. You can count on God. to see if you will have a fleshly response to it versus a spiritual response. I see you spinning, restless, toiling through the haze of a broken life Searching for the keys, the meaning in the smile of truthful lies Stop! <laughs> <laughs> we buy the boats. You enjoy them. Wow, okay. Um, our college students are not selling boats, just so we're all on the same page. Um, so that was a recap video from the Jubilee Conference that we took our students to two weekends ago in Pittsburgh. Jubilee is a unique conference in just what it's about, but every year they walk students through the story of the gospel. It's creation, fall, redemption, restoration, with the goal of getting non-believing students to come to know Christ for the first time and getting our students who are more seasoned in their faith to feel reinvigorated and reignited with a passion that knowing and following Jesus can and should change your whole life. So for our students specifically, it was a really unique weekend. We had a lot of first time new to Brookdale, new to our crew ministry students who, while Dan would be walking down the hallway on campus, he would say, hey, you should come to Jubilee. And they would say, okay, and then they did. And that's never really happened before. So that was super exciting for us to experience, for us to bring them along and watch them kind of see this big conference, this exciting worship, this new style of teaching for the first time. But more than that, it was a place and a time where our students got to love and know one another more deeply, which is really important to us. In our ministry, we strive to have our students be more than just people who come together in a space. We want them to be friends and we want them to be family. And that weekend, this weekend at Jubilee, really helped solidify those relationships. It brought people into the fold of feeling like family at this church and with our other students. Um, there were breakout sessions, like specific workshops tailored to desires and thoughts and skill sets that students had. So there were a couple girls that were 
passionately excited to go to a workshop on academic faithfulness, on how being a good student to the glory of God can change your Christian living. There were workshops that a couple of our students got to go to on psychology, so as they major in psychology and contemplate how to be a faithful biblical counselor in their future, there were professionals speaking to them from scripture and giving them wisdom and guidance on how to do that. And on top of that, we had students who came with us that, after we left, would say that they came to know Christ for the first time and since then have been taking steps of faithfulness to prove, I am now a Christian. So we just want to take a minute to thank you, the church, those of you who gave financially so that we could bring students who couldn't afford to go on their own, those who prayed for our students as we went. Our college kids, they sit right there. They're like their own little cluster. And we want you to know that you can talk to them. And they can talk to you. They want to know you. They just don't know that they want to know you yet. And you want to know them because they're awesome and you will love them. They're great. So I encourage you today, next week, as you see a student say, hey, did you go to Jubilee? And when they say yes, ask them something, their favorite part, the most impactful teaching, their favorite point in worship. And just watch them light up with the excitement as they remember this time and continue to pray for us that more students would join our ministry, that they would come to faith in Christ, and that next year we could bring even more students to Jubilee and watch it happen again. Thank you. All right, we've got a couple more things. So we got an Easter egg hunt coming up April 1st, and uh, we've been sending out um, a lot of mailers for this. We're trying to hit up every home in Lincroft to let them know about it. Um, and so we're already starting to get some pre-registrations back from the community. You don't have to pre-register to come. You could just show up. But uh, that's been exciting because there's people, I don't know who they are, and they're signing up for this thing. And so... Um, we're excited about that to get the word out and to connect with our community. So I need some help, though. Um, I need some help in some specific areas. Number one, if you have the gift of evangelism or maybe just the gift of gab, I would love to connect with you. So you could just be a floater at this event because part of it is just connecting, welcoming, and talking to people that we don't know and making them feel welcome. So I could use some, some good gabbers. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me. Also, we have a couple go-to uh, photographers in this church, but I kind of want to give them a break. And so um, if you have some passion or gifting or experience with photography and would like to walk around and snap good pictures at this event, again, please come talk to me. I would love to connect with you. And right now, though, the biggest way that you can help this event is help me get the word out. We're putting stuff out on social media. We're posting posters in Lincroft businesses. We're sending mailers. But nothing, nothing, nothing beats a personal invite. And so there's a whole stack of invite cards right out on this welcome desk. It's very high. Let's lower that a good amount. Like, take five. And if you know people that have kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces, friends, uh, invite, invite, invite. People come through personal invitation. But most importantly, this event is tied into our Easter season. And so I put together this Easter uh, prayer guide, and you'll know that I made it because it has typos in it, even though I had someone else proofread it. I think I just messed up their revisions. But... Um, this is what I'm going to be using in my own personal devotions for the next month. Um, every day, Sunday through Saturday, has a list of scriptures and prayer requests to pray over. Because that's really the engine that drives the effectiveness of, of an event is, is prayer. Is God showing up through his spirit um, as we beseech him for our salvation and growth, um, both in our community and in our church. And so I would highly encourage you to please take a prayer guide, and uh, if you feel moved by the Lord to use this in your personal prayer devotions, please be praying along with me. Every day you'll know what I've been lifting up before the Lord. Also, a couple other things. We have a baptism Sunday coming up, and there'll be a baptism class. If you're interested in being baptized, contact me, chris at linkcroftbiblechurch.org, or again, you can talk to me. We'll get you connected in that class on March 26th. There is also a women's retreat uh, coming up. And so uh, the Women's Retreat are handing out brochures today, and registration is only two weeks. Next Sunday, 312, and the Sunday after, 319. So if you'd like to go on the Women's Retreat, sign up begins next week. There is also a display and brochures out in the lobby as well for that. But with all of that said, let's turn to the Lord in a prayer of confession.
Heavenly Father, you are a holy God. You reign in all glory. And you dwell in an unapproachable light. Lord, in ourselves, in our sinfulness, we could never stand before you. And we are thankful, Lord, that in Christ, though, he has made a way for us so that we can enter in and we can enjoy the blessing of knowing you. And yet, Lord, even for those of us who do know you, we still see the remnants of our flesh, of our sinful nature, afflicting us here on this earth. And so we just take a moment of silence, Lord, to confess our sins before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who forgives and heals and restores and empowers us for your mission. Lord, we pray as we go from here that we would follow you in the strength of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this assurance of pardon from Ephesians chapter 1. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Let's continue in worship. Please stand with us. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, sin of man and the wrath of God has been
You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good chunks at least here. Good morning, church. If you would turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. We will be reading it one last time as we close out this sermon series. Um, so we'll read and then we will pray. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning, and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear. For God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness. Where God was. Father God, we so often find ourselves in this posture that we want to stand far off, that we think that we need some intermediary because we are not good enough or we are fearful of you, Lord. And we do not understand that, Lord Jesus, you are our intermediary, that you are the one who has paid the price so that we can come into the presence of a holy and mighty God. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus, for laying down your life and bringing us that access. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for not keeping these commandments. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved you with all our soul. We have not loved you with all our mind and all our strength. Oh, Lord Jesus, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Lord Jesus, forgive us for not even knowing who our neighbor is. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would rest in your completed work on the cross, that we would rest in the fact that you have reconciled us to the Father, that we no longer need to bring burnt offerings and sacrifices. Oh, Lord, create in us clean hearts, that we would rest in your completed work, and that being your people, we know that we have full access to the throne of God, and we have the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead at work within us so that we can go out into Monmouth County and share that good news. And so we pray that you would bless the egg hunt. We pray this Lenten season as we prepare our hearts to celebrate on our in our salvation, Lord, and to reflect on what you have done in reconciling us to the Father. We pray that you would just season our conversations with friends and family members and neighbors to let them know the good news of Jesus that we celebrate in this season. 
that we do not need to be trembling and standing far off, but there is love and grace and mercy and acceptance. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that your name would be made great. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill Chris now as he brings your word, that it would flow out from him, that those who know and love you would be encouraged in the faith, and that those who do not love you would hear the gospel and respond with repentance, turning from sin and turning to you. And we pray in all this, Lord God, that your holy name would be made great. Amen. I don't know about you, but uh, I love a good training montage, right, in a movie. So inspiring. Uh, one of my favorites is from the football movie, Remember the Titans. Like, we're going to change the way we block, change the way we tackle. We are changed. It's, yes. One of my favorite recent ones is from the movie, the boxing movie Creed 2, where uh, the main character goes out to the desert, and he's just beating the sand with a sledgehammer. Like, that just looks like a great workout. Um, and so, but even if we're never traveling to Arizona for training for a prize fight, we all recognize, as I heard one author uh, point this out recently, we all recognize that in order to accomplish great things, we need to deny ourselves and discipline ourselves for a greater purpose. We all recognize that if we really want to move forward in life, that we have to not be entangled with certain things which will just hold us, hold us back. And so in some sense, when we set a, a goal for ourselves or we want to be able to, to move forward in life, we will often come up with some principles or some guiding you know, rules to help us achieve uh, that goal. So it might be you know, studying eight hours a day or not eating sugar or uh, whatever it might be to help us get to where we want to go, we sometimes, in an essence, come up with like a, a, a 10 guiding principles for us to, to achieve success, or even maybe like a, a 10 commandments for ourselves of, of saying, you know, to where I want to go, I'm going to do these things, follow these things, or avoid these other things so I uh, can can get there. I don't think self-denial or discipline or even following rules is that uh, foreign to us uh, oftentimes. And yet, while we may have like our internal, you know, 10 commandments or 10 rules for success that we, that we keep uh, for ourselves, why is it so hard to keep the actual 10 commandments? How come when we come to God's word and we see uh, what God is saying here in these Ten Commandments, uh, sometimes we just find them backwards and oppressive and repressive to ourselves that we, we don't really want to, to follow them? Why would that be? Because we're, we want to come up with rules for ourselves, but why don't we want to follow the actual uh, Ten Commandments. And I think one of the reasons why is because these commandments are imposed from a higher authority than our own self-reflection. Oftentimes the rules that we make for ourselves, we make for ourselves. We reflect on our life and they come from within and they cater to our preferences and our goals and what fits for us, we think. But God's word doesn't come from a merely human authority. It comes from God's divine holy word. It's imposed. God stands above us as our creator, and as the creator, he has the right over his creation, you and me, to tell us that this is the, the path of the good life. This is a reflection of what uh, good living actually is, and yet we just chafe under that authority. Not many people really, deep down inside, like being told what to do. And so these commandments are imposed on us and we can chafe under that authority. But also the, the function of the Ten Commandments is to expose our sin. And the fact that these commandments don't only regulate outward behavior, but the very motives of our heart. That if we even lust after a woman, it's like committing 
adultery. If we have hate or harbor anger in our heart towards someone, it is like we have murdered them. That if we are not being generous and giving to those who have need, it is like stealing from them. If we are not honoring the reputation of others and upholding the most charitable way of talking about them, it is like bearing false witness against them. And so when we see these commandments and see that they call us that we should have no other gods before the Lord, we see that we have put something at the very center of our life that is not God and we're found exposed and wanting. And then being exposed, we often find ourselves in the situation like the people of Israel would be because they have heard this word and they have been found wanting and then God draws near to them on the mountain. And it's on fire. Have you ever seen a mountain that's on fire? That's also shrouded in darkness? That's the image that is being portrayed here. It says in verse 18, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain was smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. God is the creator. And it says back in Genesis chapter 1 that God spoke and everything exploded into existence. And as the creator, he is the one who created us, made us, and therefore we owe ourselves and our lives to him. You know, God is not a God to really be trifled with as if he can be bought off or appeased through our mere actions or as if he's irrelevant to life. So he comes down in his presence here with thunder and lightning and a mountain that's on fire and enshrouded in darkness because he's the majestic king of all and when the people see this though they are terrified of it terrified of it they saw it and they trembled and stood at a distance but see here's the thing right like we can hear this And maybe conjure up this image of a fiery mountain with darkness and lightning and thunder. And it might be somewhat intimidating to us, but God is drawing near to the people. Right? This is actually a moment of of grace and goodness on God's part. Because he's willing to draw near to us. See, he didn't have to save the people of Israel. They were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. And he could have left them there. But he didn't. He raised up a deliverer named Moses, and he led the people out of slavery into Egypt. He split the Red Sea into two, and the people walked across on dry land, and then they eventually made it to this mountain, called Mount Sinai, and God could have stayed silent to them. He could not have spoken, not have revealed the path to the good life, not revealed his character and his goodness to them. He could have just stayed utterly silent, and the people would have been wondering what God is like. But he graciously gives him his word, and he comes down in his presence. Now, he is indicating, yes, he is not to be messed with or taken lightly, but he is still drawing near to the people. The problem is not that God is distant, but the people are. Because you see that in the text. See, God is coming down with his presence on the mountain, but the people see it and they reject it because they're scared. They trembled and they stood at a distance. It's not that God is saying, you know what, guys? tough luck, but you're going to have to try really, 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 really hard to get to me. No, God actually comes to them, but they stand at a distance. They're separating themselves from the Lord. And I wonder, you know, how 
that dynamic works out in our own lives today as well. When God draws near to us, in what ways do you distance yourself from him? You know, in what ways do you see God beginning to work in your life that he begins pointing out like the Ten Commandments did, things that aren't quite in line with his will and and his character and how you should be living? Uh, How do you hear this, hear his word, and then begin backing away from that and saying, you know what, I I think I'm just going to just going to go over here for a minute. You know, I've been a Christian a long time already, about 30 years. I'm 35, um, and I've grown up in church. I've gone to a Christian college. I've pretty much essentially been in ministry to some capacity since I was 19 years old. Like, I've been around for a while, and I actually attended this youth group. Now, I'm running this youth group. That's a scary thought, but one of the things I've noticed over the years is that the distancing is often begins subtle. And it often begins subtly because being a part of God's church is there's accountability to it. And there's accountability here where we desire to follow God and, and his ways. But when I've seen that people start being convicted of their sin or their, God's presence is showing up, that there can be this subtle distancing where it's like, yeah, I came every week, now I come every three weeks, then every two weeks, then one week, then like every couple of months, and look, I get it, you get sick, there's vacations, I'm not even here every Sunday because of that. But that's totally different than distancing yourself from the Lord and from the people of God. It's oftentimes when we want to go our own way that we begin distancing ourselves from the Christian community because light and darkness are not compatible with one another. And when we allow darkness to to kind of infiltrate and flood through our heart, it becomes painful to be near the light. And so the people are scared because they're found wanting. They're convicted in their sin over the Ten Commandments and they don't want to approach God. And so essentially... The crowd kind of, they're like looking around and they're like, oh, Moses, here. And they shove Moses to the front and they're like, you talk to him. They say to Moses in verse 19, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. See, this is significant. You may not Notice it on first read, but this is an incredibly significant verse and how this verse fits in with the bigger story of the Bible. See, God makes these things throughout the Bible that pushes the story forward called covenants. And he pretty much becomes family with people through a covenant. And so, for example, there's Noah. God makes a covenant with Noah And that's where we get the rainbow from, because God says, I'm not going to destroy the world again. I'll give you the sign of the rainbow. But God comes directly to Noah and speaks to Noah directly. God then makes another covenant with Abraham and says, Abraham, through you, I'm going to save the whole world. And he comes directly and speaks to Abraham directly. But now here, God has shown up, and the people, they don't want to talk to God directly. They want a buffer. They want an intermediary. And so it shows that this covenant that God makes, the people are distancing themselves from God in this. We don't want to talk to God directly. We want the holy person to deal with that. So we can go about living our lives. And isn't that kind of the function of religion sometimes often in in our life? You know, maybe there's a few rituals or a few things that we're going to do. Like, that's, that's the God piece, and I'll kind of let that stand in and be the buffer between me and God. But the rest of life, I'm kind of just going to go off and do my own thing. Like, maybe I'll, I'll block out a little bit of Sunday for the God part, and that will hopefully shield me from having his claims over the rest of my life through Monday through Saturday. But that's not how God intended things to be. He wants real relationship. And so Moses explains what God is up to here. He's saying to the people, don't be afraid. 
For God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. I want to draw a distinction here in this text. It's maybe a little bit artificial, but I think maybe it could be a helpful uh, remembering point, Manom- whatever, way to remember stuff. There's a difference between being afraid and the fear of God. There's a difference between being afraid and the fear of God. The fear of God, when, when Moses says here that the fear of God may remain with you so that you may not sin, it's talking about a reverential worship, a reflecting on the awesomeness and the sovereignty and the holiness of God, bowing down before him in worship. And what Moses is saying is, if you have this relationship of worship with God first, that will shape your life and keep you from sin. See, it's relationship first and rules second, but we often get it backwards. But he's saying the fear of you, like if you're coming before the Lord in reverential worship, reflecting his holiness and his righteousness and his goodness, reflecting that back to him, it will change your life. It will keep you from these things which will destroy yourself and destroy others and destroy this relationship with you have that you have with God, with sin. That's the fear of God. And that's different, though, than being afraid of God. See, the people were afraid of God because they were still stuck in their sin. When you are still in your sin, of course we're going to be afraid of God because God is the all-righteous judge. But when we come to him for forgiveness, we can fear him rightly. His perfect love casts out fear. When you experience the love of God found in Jesus Christ alone, that will then help you to rightly fear him and worship him in reverential awe. But the people do not hear, heed Moses' words still. They're still rejecting God and Moses. It says in verse 21, so the people stood at a distance. Again, it's the same kind of language where they have distanced themselves from God. They're they're running from God. I think that this story is echoing back in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, you know, if if you remember that story, if you're hearing it for the first time, right, God created a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, put them in a garden and said, you can eat of any tree that's in this garden except for one. What did they do? They ate the tree that they weren't supposed to. And so God comes to them, and it says that God was walking in the cool of the day. That's just a metaphor for God's presence, that it, it showed up there. And what Adam and Eve did was they ran and they hid. They hid themselves from God because they recognized that they were exposed in their disobedience. They distanced themselves from God, and they sewed fig leaves to cover their nakedness, which was an image for trying to cover their sins in their own strength and power. And that's what the people are doing here. They're distancing themselves from God. They're they're running from God. They're, They're hiding from God. And so what guilt and what shame and what exposure is making you hide and run from God today? And so the people, uh, they don't want to approach God, so Moses goes instead, and it says that he approached the thick darkness where God was. So Moses is now the mediator, right? They want a buffer. They want a holy man to go between them and God so they don't have to. And so Moses goes into the thick cloud to meet with God. But that doesn't solve their problem. Why? Because in the very next verse, in verse 22, Moses goes into the cloud where God is, and then Moses comes out of the cloud, and what does Moses bring with him? More commandments. More ways that the people would fail. It says in verse 22, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall make no other gods besides me, gods of silver or gold, etc., etc., etc. And actually, 
these commandments then that Moses comes out with, it goes on 21, 22, 23, like three more chapters of commandments. It doesn't really fix their problem. So what the people need is a new and better Moses. Because Moses was just a man like them. And all he came back with was more commandments that would lead to more exposure of the ways they failed. But what they needed is someone to go into the darkness and return with forgiveness. And that's what Jesus has done for us. That's why he came. The Bible actually explains and I think echoes back to this passage in in some ways when Christ, uh, he's going to the cross to die for us. Right? Jesus was born in, the, in this world in order to die. And Jesus eventually was, was condemned as a criminal, even though he never did anything wrong. He was unjustly accused, even though he was innocent. And he was put up on that cross. And when he was crucified, he was crucified between two criminals, one on his li- right and one on his left. And as he's hanging there on that cross and dying for us, it says in Luke 23, 44, now it was about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil in the temple was torn in two and Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So on the cross, Jesus is on a mountain. It's called the Mountain of the Skull. Golgotha was where he was crucified. And he went up that mountain, and he went into the darkness for you and for me to pay for our sins. Jesus also talks in his, before he died that he would be baptized with fire, which meant receiving the fire of God's judgment. Remember the smoking mountain? Jesus went through the darkness. He received the fire of God, the wrath of God for sin, and he did that out of love for me and for you. He is the intermediary. He is the go-between that we need because he was not merely a man. He was the God-man, fully God, fully man, who went up that mountain of the cross. But now when we trust in Jesus, we actually come to a different mountain, another mountain, and the, the writer of the book of Hebrews reflects on, this, on these two mountains, Mount Sinai, where God comes in with his, his law, and Mount Zion, which is where he dwells. It says in Hebrews 12, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, And the blast of the trumpet and the sounds of the words which sound was such that those who heard them begged that no further word be spoken. For they couldn't even bear the commandment, if a beast touches this mountain, it should be stoned to death. And so terrible was the sight that Moses himself said, I am full of fear and trembling. That is the law. That is God coming with his word of law saying, you must Obey me fully, but none of us can ever stand before him because we are filled with sin. And so that is a terrifying sight, and we should be afraid of God if we are still in our sin. But Jesus changes everything. He changes everything. He went up that mountain of the cross. He went into the darkness. He took the flame of the Lord for our sin. And now it says in Christ in Hebrews 12, 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all and the spirits of all the righteous made perfect. And you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. In Christ, we have full access to God the Father. 
He has opened the way. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is only one way. It is through Jesus. And so this morning, where is God exposing you and your sin? Where are you running from him? Where are you distancing yourself from him? Because Jesus closes the distance. He closes the gap. See, I think it's a fearful thing. I think we struggle to both be known and to be loved, as one author has put it. Because what we think is, you know, if people really knew me, really knew who I was, they wouldn't love me. And we argue the other way, well, in order to be loved, and I, maybe I can receive love, but I can't be fully known. But in the gospel, we can both be fully known and fully loved. God sees the very depths of our heart, the very depths of our darkness, but Jesus went there. He went there for you and for me. And so whatever darkness is in your life, Jesus is there for you and he will heal it and he will bring his light to it. Turn to him. And this is a call for all of us. For those of you who maybe have not come to Christ yet, this is a call for you to come and turn from your sin this morning and turn to him. But even for those of us who've been a Christian for 30 years, there's always more darkness to turn over to the Lord we're not home yet. We're not perfect yet. And so let Jesus know you fully. See to the depths and bring his light. He is the only way. And he went to that cross uh, for you. And one of the amazing privileges that we have now as the people of God is that we have come to this heavenly Zion to this other mountain, this dwelling place of God. Even though we are here on the earth in our bodies, with our relationship with God, we have access to God the Father. And that's kind of what communion is about. If those of you who are helping serve this morning, if you guys could come forward and uh, you can get set up um, with the bread and and, and the cup. And while you're uh, getting those elements, I want to talk about communion briefly and uh, some of the important things about it and what it stands for. Communion, as the name implies, is a way of communing or being with Jesus. When we partake in communion, there is a sharing in the body and blood of Jesus through faith. In a sense, it's not as if we bring Jesus' body down here to earth, but it's as if by the Holy Spirit he raises us up to the heavenly Jerusalem to dine and banquet with him. How that all works, I don't know. It's a God thing. It's a mystery. It's a beautiful thing. The Lord's Supper reminds us, though, that this access that we have to the Father is only through the body and blood, the sacrificial death of Jesus. It is the only way. That's what these elements stand for. The bread stands for Jesus' broken body on the cross, and the cup stands for the shed blood of of the new covenant, this new relationship. And in this new covenant, it says that God will be speaking to us, in a sense, face to face. We have access to the Father completely through Jesus' sacrifice. And so, when we come to communion, we come in the fear of him. Reverential awe. Think about it this way, as we're reflecting on this thing. This may be the most important thing you do all week. Because it is a place where together as the family of God, through faith, that we commune with Christ. A couple of things in how we 
serve communion here at LBC? Please exit your pew to the left after I pray. You can come down and receive your elements. Then make your way back up the right side and sit. If you're unable to walk down, then we can either uh, ask maybe a neighbor to get you know, a second set of elements, or if you raise your hand, we have ushers who can bring a communion pack to you if you're unable to get up. We will distribute the elements first together, so you'll have your bread and cup and go be seated, and then we'll all partake together as the family of God. Because this is a, a family meal, a communing with Christ, and so we would ask that if you have not placed your faith in Jesus yet, to please refrain from partaking in these elements. This is a, a family meal uh, for Christians. Um, but as people are walking by, um, this may be an opportunity for you to take Christ for the very first time. And if that's something that you do during this time of communion, reflecting on your need of a Savior, a need of a, of a mediator, a need of Jesus, then we would, I would love to talk with you after and help prepare you to take communion uh, the next time that we partake in this together. And so, in this, we have a remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you now, may we remember what you have done for us, that you have gone up that mountain to face the darkness and the fire for us, that you tore the veil in two that separated us from, from the Father, and we now can boldly and confidently enter in and rest in you. In your son's name, in Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen.
the Apostle Paul spoke of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. And he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and proclaim this, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this proclamation of the gospel through song, through word, and through communion today. Lord, may it not return void, because we claim the promise that your word never returns void. It accomplishes all that it sets out to do. Lord, so we pray that this may be the day of salvation for some, and the day of encouragement, the word that we need to hear to keep pressing on and following you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Thankful for his sacrifice. In his name, amen. Please stand and sing with us, I Stand Amazed. I guess you can't sing, I Stand Amazed, sitting down, can you?
my, my closing? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You want it? <laughs> From the book of Revelation, chapter 1. It's him who is, loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Having drawn near to the Father by the work of the Son in the power of the Spirit, you are sent.